Continuing our discussion of regular expressions, last time we talked about how regular expressions describe um, regular languages in the same way that NFAs and DFAs do, and we showed how we can take regular expressions and we can compile them into NFAs, and then we can compile those NFAs into DFAs. And we talked about how we already know that we can turn DFAs back into NFAs, uh, via a kind of a trivial process, but would it be possible to turn a DFA directly into a regular expression? In other words, if I were to draw a DFA, like this one for instance, the um, one that says, is it, does it end in zero? So this machine right here that ends in zero, um, ends in zero, is it possible to turn that into a regular expression? Now, intuitively, I think that you could just figure out how to write this as a regular expression. What you would do is you would write down, you would say, how do, how do we write down ends in zero? Well, ends in zero basically means it doesn't matter what it is beforehand, it just has to have a zero at the end. Um, and so you might, down, you might write down something like zero union one, star circ zero. Although that's not quite what this one is, is because this one also includes epsilon. So we would have to also union that with epsilon. So this right here, this regular expression, might be a way that we could write down that same thing right there. Um, now, again, what we just did is we just thought really hard and we came up with a regular expression that does the same thing as this DFA. But what we'd like to be able to do is like to have a mechanical way of transforming any DFA into a corresponding regular expression. Now, to do this is a process uh, that has a few different steps. And let's walk through each one of those. So we're going to write a function called decompile. And decompile is going to take an n state DFA. Turns out that uh, the algorithm will work fine if it's given um, an NFA, but so let's just, uh, so it doesn't really matter, but let's just assume that it's um, a DFA. And then it's going to turn that into a regular expression. And the way that decompile is going to work is that decompile is going to call a function called start it's going to take an n state DFA and turn it into an n plus 2 state GNFA. A GNFA is something that I haven't defined yet, so GNFA. We're going to write a function called RIP, and what RIP is going to do is it's going to take an n plus 1 state GNFA and turn it into an n state GNFA. And then there's going to be a function called end, and what it's going to do is it's going to take a two-state GNFA and turn that into a regular expression. Now the decompile function, it's going to take a machine, and what it will do is it will call end after calling rip n times after calling start. We'll do that on n. So it's going to take uh, an m. So it's going to take a machine. It's going to call start on it to convert it into a two plus one state GNFA. Call rip on it n times, thus getting a two state GNFA, and then extract the regular expression. Okay. So we now know what all the pieces in play are going to be. I need to tell you what a GNFA is. I need to tell you what start does, what rip does, and what end does. And I think that it's all going to come down. I think that the easiest way to explain this is to, we'll first talk about what end does, then we'll talk about GNFAs, then we'll talk about start, and then we'll go back to rip. Okay? So, our end function is going to be extremely simple. <clears throat> what end is going to do 
is it's going to take a 2GMFA and return a regular expression. That two-state GNFA is basically going to be a start state with an arrow to an end state with a label on it. We'll write the label as a big giant uh, A, maybe. And now the result of calling end is just going to be exactly what that label is. And this is, of course, why the root function is set up the way that it is, which, I've, again, I haven't told you is that we want GNFAs are set up just to run this function right here. They only exist for converting DFAs into regular expressions. Okay. <clears throat> so how can we set up a GNFA? How can we set up a structure that has this information at the right point? So here's what a GNFA is. It stands for generalized, generalized, non-deterministic finite automata. And it is defined by the following um, five tuple. There's Q, which is a set of states. There's sigma, which is an alphabet. There's qs, which is a member of q. That's the start state. That's this one. And then there is a single distinguished qe, which is the end state. There's one end state. Then there's a function called big delta. And big delta it's not really a function, it's more like a relation. And what it does is it relates Q minus QE to Q minus QS. And attached to each one of those, there's a regular expression over the alphabet sigma. Okay. So let's uh, break down a few things here. So when we say Q minus QE, what we mean is that we're going to take all of the Qs and we're going to remove QE. When we say Q minus QS, we're going to take all of the Qs, all of the states, and we're going to subtract QS. What delta means is that, um, is that you could move from the state on the left to the state on the right using any um, any string accepted by the given regular expression. So for example, when we look at the end function, end is going to be called with a two GNFA. If it's called with a 2 at GFA, that means that it's always called with QS, QE, some sigma, QS, QE. Then it's called with that delta. And what's inside of that delta? Well, it's a set that has a mapping between QS and QE, and then some regular expression R. And what it returns is that R right there that regular expression, because what that regular expression means is you could go from the start state to the end state um, given that regular expression. Okay, now that we know what a GNFA is, we know how end works, let's go back and look at how start works. So what start does is it's going to take an end state DFA and return an n plus 2 state GNFA. So that means that its input is a DFA, which has Q, sigma, Q0, delta, which goes from Q cross sigma arrow Q, and F. 
and its output is a GNFA, so we'll call that Q prime, sigma, QS, QE, and delta. And here's the way that it works. Q prime is just going to be Q plus new distinguished states QS and QE. So we're going to have two new states. Okay. Now, how do we, so now we know what QS and QE are, they're just two new unique states. So what is going to be the delta function? So recall that the delta function looks like this. It takes in a QI and a QJ, and it returns a regular expression. So what actually are those? Here's what they are. Delta QS Q0, that's the new start state and the old start state, is going to be equal to epsilon. And then delta of QS QJ, such that QJ does not equal Q0, is going to equal null, because there's no path from those. Then we're going to say that QF, where that's inside of F, QE is equal to epsilon, so we're going to make it so that there's an epsilon path from any of the accepting states to QE. And for all QF that's not inside of F, sorry, for all QJ not inside of F, QE is null. And then lastly, there's just one last little thing, which is just that delta of QI QJ is going to be equal to a union of all C such that delta of QI C contains QJ. Okay, so this is a formal definition of the start function. Now let's look at a concrete example of it. So a concrete example. So suppose that we have the um, the ends in zero machine. So there's a zero here, a one over to there, a one here, and a zero back. Okay, so this is our input. All right, and then what happens after we call start? After we call start, we're going to have a new distinguished start state. And we're going to have an epsilon arrow to our old start state. There's still a 0 there, and a 1 over to here, and a 1 here, and a 0 back. But then there's also an epsilon transition over to QE. All right. Now that's the way that we draw the picture, but of course, what does the delta function look like? So the delta function, let's label these a and b, so a and b. So its input on the left-hand side is going to say qs, a, and b. And then its output on the other side is going to be a, b, and qe. So this is the delta relation. Okay, so now what goes inside of each one of these? Well, QS to A is going to be epsilon, and we know that it's epsilon because we know that when S goes to the start state, it's epsilon. And we also know that A to the end state is also going to be epsilon because that used to be inside of, um, of F. And QS has an empty transition to everything else. In those empty transitions, we don't write in the graph. So there's no arrow from QS to B, and there's no arrow from QS to QE. So that's why they're null. Similarly, there's no way to get to QE except through things in F, so that means that this is also null. There's no path from B down to QE. But now, what about these ones? Well, how do we get from A to A? Well, we look at the original graph, and we say, how is A connected to A? And it was connected with 0. So we write down a 0 there. How is A connected to B? It was connected with a 1. How is B connected to A with a 0? 
and how is B connected to B with a 1? So this table right here is the delta relation in the new GNFA, and we can draw it as this picture right here. All right. So what's the next step? So the next step is to define this function rip. And rip's job is to go from an n plus 1 GNFA to an n state GNFA. And notice that because at the very end we're going to call end, we're going to rely on QS and QE being there, that means that what we're going to, what RIP's job really is to do is to make it so that we have a machine, a GNFA, that means the same thing, but now has one fewer state in it. In particular, one fewer state of the ones that's not the starter end state. Okay, so how can we do that? So rip takes an n plus 1 GNFA and returns a GNFA. So that means that its input is going to be Q sigma QS QE and delta. And its output is going to be Q prime, sigma, QS, QE, and delta prime. We know that the whole point is for it to be the same machine, except now with one less thing. So that means that we know that Q must be equal to Q prime plus one other state. We'll call that one QR, the R for ripped, the one that gets ripped away. Okay, so Q prime is just going to have one thing missing. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that delta was a function that went from Q minus QE cross Q minus QS and returned a regular expression. Okay, but Q had QR in it, so this side had QR in it, but Q prime is not going to have here, this new delta prime, it doesn't have QR. So QR, oops, QR is up here, but QR is not down here. So what that means is, is that this new delta function has things missing from it, things that used to be going to Q. If we look at QR in the graph, there used to be stuff pointing at it. And it used to be pointing at other stuff. These things that was pointing at it, it had whenever it appeared over here. Sorry, whenever it appeared over here. And these things it was pointing to were whenever it was over there. Okay, but now we have to come up with a new delta prime that's missing those things. So how can we figure out what those would be? Imagine, uh, let me switch pages. Imagine that we had two states, qi and qj. And there's some arrow between them. Let's, add, let's name that arrow um, u. All right. But now, what if qi used to point at qr? Let's label that x. And what if QR used to point at QJ? 
But we're going to get rid of... But we're going to get rid of QR, and it's not going to be there anymore. And since it's not going to be there anymore, that means that this path right here that goes from QI to QJ no longer has all of the information that was in the original graph. Because it turns out that in the new graph, there's only going to be QI and QJ, and QR is not going to be there anymore. So that means that we need to change the label from just U to U union. Oh, I shouldn't have called it U. Let's change it from being U to being, um, hmm. It's another one. Uh, let, let's have it be like a fancy L. Okay. L union X circ Z. And what we could do then is if we change the delta function from looking like this to looking like that, then now we've preserved all of the same information, but we've removed QR from the graph. Now, if you think a little bit harder about this, you realize that there's actually another edge that might matter. What if QR had a loop with itself? If it had a loop with itself, then that means that the new path should not be x circ z, but should actually be x y star z. Because on the path from qi to qj, we could either take the l road, or we could take the x road, y a bunch, and then take the z road. Okay. Now, how can we express this concept in math? Well, what is L? L is just big delta of qi qj. And what's x? x is big delta of qi qr. Y is big delta of QR, QR, and Z is big delta of QR, QJ. All right? So what that means is, is that the new delta prime function The new delta prime function, we can define it like, we can define it like so. We can say that delta prime of qi qj is equal to delta of qi qj, unioned delta of qi qr, circ delta of qr qr star, circ delta of qr qj. We'll put parentheses there. Okay? So the thing that's beautiful about this is that it's actually trivial to just do an inductive definition of the output of calling rip. You just pick an element qr, and you just define a new delta prime. And this new delta prime is just this little function right here. And we know that qi and qj will never be qr because we won't expose those you know, when we return, our q, we return our q function. So this is all well and good to think about the math, but now let's do a concrete example of it. So let's walk through the whole algorithm with our third from, sorry, with our ends in zero. Okay, so we got one, one, zero. Okay, so now let's call in on it. I'm oh, sorry, let's call start on it. So we'll call start, and we'll get our new accept state, sorry, our new start state with an epsilon over to here with a 0, a 1, a 1, and a 0, and then an epsilon to there, which is accepting. Then we'll call rip on that once. And let's rip out this node right here. 
So our new picture will have the same accept state with an epsilon over to here. Now this node has a self loop. All right, it has a self loop. But that self loop currently says zero, but it's now possible for it to go one, one star zero. So that means that we're gonna change it to zero union one, one star zero, and then another epsilon over to here, which is the accept state. Then we can rip this again, and we'll get our start state with an edge to our accepting state, and it reads on top of it, epsilon circ zero union one, one star zero circ epsilon, which is of course just equal to zero union one, one star zero. Um, did I make a mistake? Oh, and then that is starred. And so that whole thing is starred. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So that's a conversion from this machine uh, to that one. Uh, sorry, from this input machine to that regular expression. Not exactly the same regular expression that we wrote by hand, but, you know, it is still correct. So let's look at another example. Let's do the third from end is one. So we have a loop here on zero one, one, zero one, zero one, accepting. Okay, so let's first do start on it. So to do start, we'll just add extra states. Okay, then let's rip them. I suggest uh, let's rip them from you know left to right. So we'll have this state right here, and now it used to have no edge from that one, but now it exists, so we'll have an edge over to that state, which now reads epsilon circ zero one, so we have zero one star circ one, and then we have zero one, zero one, whoops. Let me uh, clean that up. And then this is the something state. Okay. So now let's now let's rip this state. So then we'll go directly to there, and the edge now says zero one star circ one circ zero union one, and then that goes with a year union one to here, with an epsilon to there. These are kind of boring, actually. You kind of know where this is going. We're going to get to zero, one, star, one, zero, union one, zero, union one. Okay, and that's going to be the end. It's kind of a boring one. Let's do it for a weird machine. Uh, I'm just going to, like, draw some random machine that I have no idea what it does. So let's say that we're going to have um, our start state is going to have a loop over here on zero. Let's have on a one, we'll go over to here. Let's have over on this state. Um, uh, let's make it so that uh, that on a zero goes over here and on a one goes over here. Uh, let's make it so that this one loops on a one, goes up here on a zero, which should happen here. Let's make it so that one goes back to this one on a zero and over here on a one. And then let's make it so, let's make it so this is the accepting state. So we'll turn this into a GNFA by adding epsilon transitions. Okay. So now we have to figure out some order to um, to rip them. So I don't really know what order to rip them in, so let's just destroy this one first. So if we destroy that one first, then we'll have this one right here go to this state. Now, does this one interact with it? No, it doesn't. So that means that it stays the same there. And so that means that this one 
goes to that state, and um, it doesn't have any interaction with that one. What about, it doesn't have any existing self loop, but now it does because it can have a one zero. So let's add a little self loop to it with one zero because it can go down there and come back. And then it used to be that it could go down here with a zero, but now it can also go with a one one. So that means that there's an edge down here with a zero union one one down to that state, which has a loop on one and goes up to there on zero. Okay. So what do we want to kill next? So next let's kill this one. So we'll go over to here. And so we'll go start state. And it used to have no path um, uh, from there to here. But now of course it, uh, it does from this path. So it's going to have an edge over to that state that's going to be epsilon 0 star 1, so it's now just going to be 0 star 1 over to there, which has a self loop on 1, 0, on epsilon over to there, and it has a path down to this one with 0 union 1, 1 over there on 1. It has a loop to itself with one, and it used to not have any way to get back to there, but now but now it has zero, zero, star, one. So there's an arrow back to there that says zero, zero, star, one. Okay. So now let's get rid of this state right here. Let's move up to here. And so then we have the start state, that's this one, and then um, it still has the same way to get to that one, which is 0 star 1, and then that one still has uh, only the single epsilon to the end, but it has a more complicated self loop now, because it used to have 1, 0, but now it also has 0 union 1, 1 star, 0, 0 star, so that is 0 union 1, 1, then 1 star, then 0, 0 star 1. Okay? Then we can rip this last thing and end up with the final thing, which would be 0 star 1, circ that, onto 1, 0, 0, union 1, 1, 1, star, 0, 0, star, 1, and then that's all starred. And then that's the whole thing. So what this shows is that we can take an arbitrary DFA, go through the algorithm, and end up with a regular expression that does the same thing. We've now shown that regular expressions are intermingleable with DFAs, which are also intermingleable, you know, interchangeable with NFAs. They're all just equivalent ways of representing the same idea. There's one idea, which is a regular language. And there are at least three representations. Representations. And those are DFAs, NFAs, and regular expressions. Yeah, let's call this Rex, regular expressions. What we'll do next time is we'll remind ourselves about how this fits into the whole framework of what we're talking about and uh, of all different possible uh, computations. So we'll do that next time.